Thank you so much, Dasha. My name is Rita Cronites, and I am with the Academy of Peer Services, which is a program in New York State. And I'm joined today by my colleagues, Dr. Jonathan Edwards, Dr. Joanne Forbes, Gita Enders, and on video, um, Dr. Amy Spagnolo. Uh, we'll all be doing various portions of the presentation, and I'm just here to uh, kind of get the ball rolling. So with Without further ado, I'd like to, to launch a poll. So if you could launch the poll now, Libby, that would be great. This is just for you, you to let us know who you are, just what your primary role is. Let us know if you're a supervisor, a peer support worker, a non-peer service provider, a service user, a family member, a training provider, or something else. So let's take about... 15, 20 seconds to, to fill out the poll and then we'll we'll have a sense of who's in the room here today. I have a sneaking suspicion we might have a few supervisors just based on the, <laughs> on, the on the content of what we're prevent, presenting, but um, it's always good to know a little bit more about who's here so that we can tailor the presentation if we need to in a different direction. So, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. And does everybody see the results of the poll? What I'm showing is 75% supervisors, 25% peer support workers. So that's about 75-25 split. And so with that, I'd like to also introduce a very short um, exercise in the chat. And this is simply, as you think about your favorite supervisor in a word or a phrase, how would you describe your best, most favorite supervisor? And that can be somebody who's a current supervisor, a past supervisor, or if you don't have, if you've never had a supervisor before, although I'd have a hard time imagining that, just who, who would be your ideal supervisor? So in a word or phrase, what would that look like? What, what, would, what, would, what does your favorite supervisor look like? And I'm seeing things like humble, I love that, inviting, open, supportive, caring, caring, understanding, understanding. Those are great words. We're going to see more of these kinds of words as we go through this session. Trust me, supportive, empowering, that's a great one, available, wonderful, flexible, encouraging, supportive, and never stops praising or appreciating us. Those are wonderful, wonderful traits for a supervisor to have. Caring, super nice, motivational, that's a good one. Supportive, visionary, visionary, those are great. Empathic, uplifting. So those are wonderful attributes for a supervisor to have. And what this session is really about is how, if, as, you're, if you, as you're being a supervisor, what are some of the tools that you can use to be that su supervisor for somebody else? And with that, I'm going to pass the uh, baton to my colleague, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Rita, and good afternoon again, everyone. I believe it's afternoon in all three time zones or four time zones uh, who are participating today. We're happy to have you here. Um, so I just want to give a little bit of background as to why we're talking about supervision, even though we suspect that there were a few supervisors in the room, as Rita said. So this is nothing that's brand new, but it's an ever emerging peer workforce in the United States and internationally is growing. Um, there's a recent study that estimates the number of certified peer specialists nationally to be greater than 25,000. And if you notice, that's certified peer specialists. And many peer specialists, and we know like California, for example, um, peers will begin to be certified very soon. So if we talk about the entire universe of peer specialists other than or in addition to certified peer specialists, that that number is probably much greater than 25,000. We also have had an uptake in organizational interest for whatever reason, um, sometimes good, sometimes um, a little questionable, and buy-in of peer support staff, both in mental health and substance use disorder programs. And there's also a historical underutilization of established models guiding supervisory practice in the human services. And so, you know, that's sort of like the big umbrella concern is that supervision is something that oftentimes gets short shrift and we're looking at it more closely among the peer support staff. Next slide, please. Hi, this is Gita in the dark, trying to work on that. Um, 
So what are we trying to achieve here? We are going to define the five critical functions of supervision. You will be able to describe the core competencies and how they were identified for each function. We will talk about using the five critical functions in the practice of supervision. And you'll have the opportunity to participate in research on the five critical functions. Rita? And just as a little bit of a teaser for what's coming along, we're joined by our colleague, Joanne Forbes, who's done research in this area. And our team is actually doing research on the five critical functions of supervision and the core competencies that make up those five critical functions. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we're gonna do a scenario role play around the critical functions. So you see how that works in practice. And with that, I will hand it over to Gita again. <laughs> So supervision is not merely counting the number of clients seen, the number of forms filled out, the number of cases filed. I mean, I think this, talk about teasers, this I think was what people think of when they hear the word supervision, they're thinking about task supervision or administrative supervision as we have in our cartoon. Do you realize that this month you made 17% more trips to the water cooler? This is not the supervision we're talking about. Jonathan, help us define supervision. Thanks, Gita. So supervision is defined as a structured relationship with the goal to help the individual gain attitudes, skills, and knowledge needed to be a responsible and effective worker. And some of those skills are what we call the softer skills, those that you won't necessarily find in a textbook or that you'll find on a competency assessment, but really, really important skills like um, relating to people, um, how you engage, um, how you listen. These are really key, important um, skills, not just for supervisors, but also the people that they supervise. Um, supervision is also rooted in the development of social work and casework. And this is demonstrated in the concern for the various needs of people that we assist or people that we support. Um, and you can see those ladders there that, you know, people are, you know, sort of meeting others where they're at, they're, you're climbing up, you know, sometimes as a supervisor, uh, we need to kind of get up and move from around the desk and be next to the person and show that concern and model what engagement is all about. And then lastly, and, um, you know, quite relevant is that supervision encompasses administrative supportive, educated advocacy and evaluative functions. And we're gonna talk more about those shortly. Excuse me, the supervisory partnership. So what supervision represents is a significant alliance between two individuals who have different roles, but are working together towards common goals. Teamwork, communication, mutual respect and professional development. This is what the supervisory partnership with the supervisee is about. Joanne. Thank you, Gita. And hello, everyone. To talk more about what both Gita and Jonathan are saying, is when I began my research into supervision, particularly supervision of peer support workers, first of all, what I discovered is that although there's a lot of research on the big umbrella supervision, A, there's not a lot of consensus under that umbrella and it kind of means, depends on who you're following or talking to, what they say to you about supervision. But what was of greater interest to me is that anecdotally, there was a lot out there about supervision of peer support workers. And that was wonderful because it meant that all of us out there in the field were making contributions. Given that we live in a world that just loves academic research, what I was disturbed to discover is there really was very little about supervision of peer support workers in the academic, quote unquote, um, research. And so that's what I wanted to study. And just quickly, kind of a, a trailer, if you will, um, 
what I and my colleagues learn talking to people across the United States is that what's important to peers as they're supervised is first of all, the supervisor's attitude. And you know, while people were putting their adjectives about their favorite supervisor in the chat, all I could think of is those descriptors that you used really spoke to the supervisor's attitude, you know, how they came across as the person who is gonna help you discover your role. But the other three things that became real important is that peers want a supervisor to help them with what's called integration, role integration. Um, myself and my colleagues like to talk about inclusion, not just integration, inclusion. And peers also wanted supervisors to be trauma-informed and to have that skill set. And finally, to also be active in facilitating and building support for peer support workers in the workplace. The key finding, the drum roll that needs to go here all the time until we can convince all the states that this is how it should be, peers want to learn from other peers. They want to learn from others who have done the same job but have more experience, right? Makes sense. Not clear why that isn't automatically happening, but we are getting there. Oh, we went backwards. Got to go forward. Okay. So as an intro to the rest of what we're gonna talk about, as I said, there's little research. The gray literature has a lot. Um, my study was a beginning step to start looking qualitatively about what's going on out there between peers and their supervisors. But the next step, which is in progress, which you're gonna hear more about from my colleagues today is a real, drill down into looking at the supervision functions. Next slide, please. And lived experience versus academic credentials, they're different. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about that, but I am gonna hand it over to my colleague, Jonathan Edwards, because he has found himself right in the middle of those two wonderful, interesting, and different perspectives. Jonathan. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Forbes. And I just really wanted to call you Dr. Forbes because I was there when you began this dissertation research and I was there when you defended. And I'm just always so humbled to be in your presence because you really have put out one of the first you know, studies on um, really exploring um, this angle of supervision. And I just want to give a call out to my mom, uh, the late Jewel M. Edwards. Um, you know, I say that with a big smile on my face because Joanne, when you said, I found myself smack in the middle. I remember when I was a kid, my mother would say, you always find yourself in the middle of these stews. <laughs> so I just wanted to sort of give her a call out. But um, a key finding in Dr. Forbes's research is that lived experience and academic credentials are often seen in opposition to or mutually exclusive. And that's sort of my takeaway from this uh, finding here is that lived experience and academic credentials, they get operationalized differently in the workplace. And I don't think the workplace is really ready to see these two integrated. And that's one place that I will use the word integration. Um, this dichotomy, it's often reinforced by a notion among licensed professionals that lived experience alone is a proxy for formal education and other job skills. In other words, a diagnosis is not uh, you know, the main qualification to get a job as a peer specialist. And further, the topic of lived experience versus academic credentials is an ongoing spirited debate among peer support workers that holding an academic degree or a clinical license somehow signifies betrayal of the peer support profession. And to illustrate this little dilemma, allow me to share a little of my own story. And, you know, that will also provide some background on the genesis of the five function supervision model, 
that we're going to introduce and draw upon in our workshop activity. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So um, actually, if we can go back one slide. Okay, great, thank you. So, you know, affirmed and encouraged by my supervisor in 2009 to take stock of the myriad functions and tasks that in, were embedded in my role as a director and a supervisor of nearly 30 peer specialists, I began to think more critically about how the workplace roles in my own personal lived experience both informs and potentially limits my judgment when conducting supervision. In other words, these attributes challenge my objectivity. So two th key things that I came away with in mind is that one, I needed to flesh out the layers and the tasks of supervision in an organized matrix. And two, I needed to be deeply reflective about fairness and accountability when engaging supervisees and responding to their workplace concerns, including personal situations and circumstances that would inevitably impact how they show up in their job. And since my major concern was that I would either be too stringent or too lenient when responding to supervisees, I initially conceptualized this multifunction supervision model as an accountability tool, which would help guide me through the maze of workplace situations that are raised in supervision. This was a vital process since I embodied both lived experience and academic credentials. In fact, I identified as a peer supporter, even though I had a management position. I was also a licensed master social worker and was applying to a doctoral program. I was a researcher, a coach, a change agent, and often a person struggling in my own recovery process. But yet I needed to show up um, with accountability and responsibly and consistently for people who look to me for modeling. And so that's what really led to my developing this model because I needed an accountability tool. I needed to see on paper what it is I'm supposed to be doing and what that looks like. Hence, what we have on the next slide is a colorful, colorful representation of what we're going to talk about. And I always call this the pretty slide because it really doesn't have much function. And the irony is it's about five critical functions, but the real functionality comes in the very next slide, if we can go to that. And that's our matrix of five critical functions of supervision. So um, I can't see it very well, but um, you know, you would think that I would know this by heart by now. So, you know, I contend that supervision doesn't begin uh, with talking about the work or evaluating one's work, but really it begins, um, and I'm gonna try to just sort of speed this along with the administrative function. And that's, you know, um, hiring and identifying uh, the talent that is a fit for the job. As I said earlier, you know, one's diagnosis or lived experience alone does not qualify that person to work as a peer support specialist. And of, oftentimes supervisors are involved in writing the job description, identifying, recruiting, interviewing, hiring. And, you know, in my own practice experience, I've been told you know, this person's really very nice. Oh, this young man reminds me of the young man on the blind side, which I found to be very racist and classist, but I was sort of compelled, you know, I was sort of like leaned on to hire someone because someone above me felt sorry for them. And uh, obviously I still have some feelings about that because I think that we can set people up to do even further damage. And Dr. Forbes in her research talked a lot about moral injury. You know, we put people in situations and it's not a fit or we assign them job tasks that are not a fit and that can be extremely wounding. So we really need to be mindful when we're making, when we're hiring and when we're identifying that it's not about doing favors or feeling sorry for people. I think that's a spillover from seeing peer specialists as former patients as opposed to colleagues and employees. So we look at the supportive um, domain and that's um, a lot about building rapport and providing constructive feedback. Um, I really can't see the slide, but um, I'll go on to educate. And educate is um, explaining the big picture, um, helping someone to really understand the purpose of their work. We look at advocate that really has to do with um, not just supporting the peer specialist, but also 
uh, educating other staff and the organization on the role of the peer specialist. And we'll go to evaluate and evaluate most people here as, oh, performance evaluation time. It's that time of the year again. No, this is an ongoing need to communicate clearly the expectations of the job, help to manage expectations, uh, particularly around other people's behaviors and viewpoints and that, you know, we're not there to fix people, but we're there to educate our colleagues on the value of peer support. And the supervisor needs to be ever so mindful of that. Um, also, it, it does involve conducting performance evaluations, but those should not be the first time when someone learns about their job performance, either their strengths or their deficiencies. Um, that should be something that is discussed regularly. Um, people see uh, corrective uh, performance action as a punitive process, but it can be a highly developmental process when we let a person know what they're doing really well and other areas where they can do better. And that really can happen once a year when a person sees their performance evaluation. So evaluation is an ongoing process. So this is just a, uh, an example, sort of like a broad brushstroke 30,000 foot level of what the critical functions of supervision in practice could look like. And I apologize for not doing a better job, but I usually do sort of eyeball the chart and then riff, then I can't actually see the chart. So <laughs> it lets you know that I know a little bit about something that I developed. So if we can go to the next slide, that would be great. So actually the next slide is going to be a recording of Dr. Amy Spagnolo. She's going to be talking a little bit about the research that we're doing on these five critical functions. So bear with me for a minute while I switch places here. Um, I need to switch to a video. And move my, here we go. Thanks so much for that overview of the five functions of supervision model, Jonathan, and for giving us a little bit of background on how you developed the model. Um, my name is Amy Spagnolo, and I'm very sorry that I can't be there live with my team to present today and to interact with all of you. Um, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to record this segment of the presentation. Um, where I would like to spend my time describing um, the research. And I'd like to focus my time with you on a specific method that we've been using in order to develop a survey of the competencies um, for supervision. Um, so as you learned, the functions were initially developed by Dr. Edwards and described a bit earlier in this presentation. And those functions guided the first round of subject matter expert focus groups that we conducted uh, with expert panelists who discussed each of the functions of the model um, and gave us a bit more information that we ultimately will be using for a much larger survey of the supervision competencies. So we began with four focus groups, and they were convened to identify competency statements from each of the functions of the supervision model. The research team then used um, a scripted protocol, including a welcome, an orientation, and a statement of the purpose of the research. And we used that script across all four groups, just for consistency. Um, I then facilitated a discussion of each of the functions with the subject matter expert panelists and asked them to identify what were the specific, specific competency statements of the peer support specialist supervisor in each of those five categories. Um, prior to asking the questions, we did define competency. And it was defined and repeated throughout the focus group discussion as a cue to remind the panelists that we were looking for very specific statements um, that described what peer support specialists um, need to do in order to effectively provide supervision. 
The panelists themselves that participated in the focus groups were chosen by our research team um, to represent diversity and ex expertise in peer support supervision. And in particular, we were looking for a variety of ages, ethnicities, races, sexual identities, genders, and from different regions of the state. Uh, in total, we had 26 panelists join us for the focus groups. In round one of our review of focus group responses, we took all the data and compiled it from the four focus groups and reviewed um, each of the responses using coding conventions that we established as a group. Um, based on a consensus process, responses from the panelists were then organized into a single data sheet that included the five functions and then lists of competency statements for each of those categories. The competencies were then sent back to the panelists for review and feedback, um, and the competency statements were also sent to 30 peer support specialists from around the state for their feedback. We were looking for um, some convergent validity and the ability to get the sense and the perspectives of working peer support specialists about these supervision competencies. In round two of our review, um, the secondary responses from the original panelists, as well as the feedback from the peer support specialist respondents were compiled, and those were added to the competency data sheet. Um, our research team then assigned, where each member was assigned a function um, and tasked with the revision process to incorporate salient comments um, from the panelists and the PSS respondents. Uh, a, another review where team members um, then looked at a function that was already addressed by another researcher um, was conducted and that resulted in a final set of competency statements. Um, a review of the extant literature on supervision um, including both published studies as well as the gray literature um, was conducted by uh, Dr. Forbes. And that was really to help us to identify any gaps in the competency statements that we discovered in our research as compared to what had already been published or available um, as an open source um, product. The competencies from the literature were then incorporated into the five functions with their placement determined by the research team based on our own um, subject matter expertise. And then in round three, um, the final competency statements will be presented in an online survey to evaluate their importance, their frequency, and their criticality in the supervision role. Um, this weighted type of metric will help us to prioritize the competencies as well as the validity of the actual five function model. Um, the survey is going to be disseminated to supervisors as well as peer support specialists and the data that we collect will again be coded similar to our first three rounds of review um, based on respondent type uh, so that we can also do some additional comparative analyses among the two types of respondents. If anyone has any interest in learning more about the research component, um, please feel free to reach out to one of the research team members that are um, presenting this for you today. And thanks so much for, for your time and your interest. Okay, and I believe we're back to Gita now. Oops, <laughs> sorry. It's fine. So we're going to take a little <coughs> journey into the five critical functions of supervision by breaking out into small groups. After a volunteer reads the following supervision situation, Participants will utilize the five critical functions of supervision and practice to respond to the question that follows the situation. The matrix, five critical functions of supervision and practice, 
provides the examples of each function that we use to inform a response to various situations. Now, because of time, I'm going to read the, scenario, the following scenario and Dr. Edwards will model the response so that we can sort of guide you into the breakout session. So here's the uh, situation that we'll be working with. It is providing supervision with a peer specialist addressing boundary issues while providing services in the community. Timothy is a peer navigator for a well-known community-based organization. Dolores, one of the people he supports, overheard Timothy talking about the wonderful and enlightening church service he attended last week. Seeking to find a church family and wanting a sense of belonging, Dolores approached Timothy to ask if she could attend service with him on the following Sunday. Unsure of how to respond, Timothy asks Dolores if he can get back to her later and then contacts his supervisor to discuss the matter. Using one or more examples from the critical functions of supervision and practice, how might you, as Timothy's supervisor, consult with him around this issue? Jonathan. Okay, thank you, Gita, for reading that. And I just want to say full disclosure, if you were in the workshop uh, with Dr. Jessica Wolf and myself about two hours ago, you saw the same scenario. And it's not that anyone stole anyone's work. It's that in the tri-state area, we're just one big happy family. And uh, we <laughs> we beg, borrow, and steal lovingly. So yes, uh, I said to Jessica yesterday, I said, you know, we're using the same scenario. But, you know, I just say it leads to deeper learning. So um, I think what Gita is wanting me to do instead of our role play is just to say that the five critical functions chart that you saw and you will see again, and it's also available as a handout, um, what you can do is to use that to select um, sort of pre written responses or come up with more of your own, because one of the things I didn't say about the model is that it's not exhaustive, but it, it does sort of cover a broad range of supervision responses or responses that could be used in supervision. And so with Timothy, um, and we don't want to say too much, um, because we know that you have a lot of wisdom to bring to how to respond to this. So I think what I'll just say here is, rather than tell you how to do it, is to sort of invite you to use the functions of supervision to formulate responses to supporting Timothy as Timothy's supervisor um, as he consults with you around this issue. So if we can go to the next slide, we see that we have this matrix again, and you also saw the scenario. Um, Gita, were we going to do another one or are we just sticking with this one? Um, no, we're sticking with this one because being that this is a national conference, I'm expecting a lot of fruitful answers, different answers from people in rural locations where there may not be many uh, worship opportunities available to closely packed urban areas. So I think we'll see a lot of interesting and varied response to this. Yeah. And we're looking for responses in the chat, correct? and uh, with some um, intermittent verbal responses from people. Hmm. I'm looking in the, um, hmm. I thought we have, were having breakouts, otherwise <laughs> I would not have rushed so quickly to read, but. Um, oh. We should okay. have the breakouts. I think that that would be great. That's why I had a question mark at the end, but my inflection probably wasn't accurate. So yes, we do have breakout rooms. Um, Dasha? Yes. How many, you want five people per room? How many people do we have all together? 60, and that include the, well, Including including the presenters, we have 61. So about 55 when I. So, you know, I heard a rumor that uh, Rita and Gita did a great job and did 10 groups of five. So it sounds like maybe we should do 12 groups of five. I'm, Would you concur with that, Rita and Gita and Joanne? I'm just wondering if it, it's possible that um, some people may have stepped away from their computer because I see so many people with their cameras off. I'm wondering if we would do better to have groups of 10 and then if some people have stepped away, you could still have a conversation. 
open to suggestions. It sounds plausible to me. Okay. Yeah. We can do breakout rooms now. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and how long did you want the breakout rooms for? Time check, Dita. How long would the breakout rooms be for? Well, we want people to have time to share out when they return, um, either in the chat or by speaking. We are now at 513. Why don't we say seven minutes or is that too long? Maybe five minutes? Okay, five minutes. We'll go now. I just put the uh, link back into the chat. It might be a good idea to go to the different rooms and make sure that they've got that. Um, yes, I can broadcast that message to the room. Okay. Um, that would be it's a, great. It's a PDF. I'm not yeah. sure how, uh, <clears throat> let, me, let me do that now, see how that works out. Yeah, that link should open up in the uh, when they receive it. Um, Okay. I'm also noticing, as as uh, Libby said, there's a lot of cameras off and a lot of people still in the participant list. Yes, we we've we've been kind of monitoring this today um, in other rooms, and um, so that's why she was messy, uh, giving that message. So uh, ho yeah, hopefully we're not an outlier. <laughs> well, so one good sign for me is that. I don't know if you guys could see, but we can see when um, people actually accept the invitation. And people who are normally really act or are, are active, they do join on their own. And it, it's only about three people per room, three or four people per room out of 10. So that's not bad. So there's good, there should be good interaction in, in each room. Well, that's what counts. So thank you. You're welcome. And just to just to check, would you, um, Rita? I was going to see. Did you want me to send a snapshot of your poll response, or are you okay? No, that's fine. Thanks. Okay. And Rita, I grabbed the snapshot of it if you need it. Okay. Good year. Quick thinking. I did not grab any snapshots.
time passes fairly quickly. I was going to give them a one minute. Uh, or do you want to yeah. give them more time? We can give them, uh, yeah, I, I think giving them a minute uh, now is good. Yeah. And I know they didn't have much time, but, you know, these are fast on their feet thinkers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm closing out the room and we'll start to see people come back in. Dasha, thank you so much for your help. Oh, you're welcome. I'm happy I could help. Thank you for giving such great content. Appreciate it. We're happy to be here. We have about 10 seconds and everyone will be back in the room. Okay. <laughs> Sitting too still, the lights went out. Uh, by the way, uh, Gita and Jonathan, it's uh, awesome to see you two again. Yes, you too, Philip. I always say you're my middle namesake. <laughs> <laughs> it is good to see you, Philip. I miss yeah. the um, I miss the uh, regional meetings we'd have with Celia. Everybody would come. Uh, yeah, hopefully uh, we can get that started up again. Um, you know, I uh, I joined the, uh, the the regional peer network family. I don't know if you heard of the RPN. Um, I'm represent New York City uh, uh, with the with that group. Oh, that's great. So that, that started like two weeks ago. So I've been really, really busy. <laughs> hey, hey. Everyone is officially back in the room. Oh, right. Okay, great. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to adjust my screen. So I think we can go to the next slide, correct? Oh, no. So what we wanna know now is we can leave it on the question slide or actually let's go back. Yes, let's go back to the slide before because what we're gonna ask people to do now is to share about um, how they and their uh, small group members chose to respond to um, the prompt after the scenario. And so um, I'm not sure, Gita, are we going to have people type in the chat and raise hands or not raise hands, but type in the chat and um, give verbal responses? Uh, 
Yes, I think we should go ahead with that. It's yeah, we I I don't know who can see raised hands. People usually jump to the front of the queue. Yeah. So if you well, raise your audience... hand, you'll jump to the front of the queue and or just, you know, or just chime in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what we're asking is, what did you think that a good supervisor might say to Timothy or work out with Timothy to help him make a decision with regard to Dolores? Okay, so there are two hands. So we have um, John, J-A-A-N, and then we have um, Reverend Dr. Philip Williams. So John, can we hear from you first? I hope I'm not botching your name too much. <laughs> no, that was, that was really close. My name is Jan. And I work in Santa Barbara at the Mental Wellness Center. And um, one thing that I suggested starting out um, is to provide that support and share, um, pro providing constructive feedback of, you know, that's great that you came to your supervisor to ask this question. I could see how this might be a difficult scenario. Um, and also, it sounds like you have really positive rapport with this person, um, and it's it's great that they're you're influencing them to get more involved in the community, and just that is a starting point in just providing that support to um, to this uh, peer peer specialist. Thank you, Jan. Uh, we can hear from Philip and then Denise. And Frank. Uh, I also added uh, that um, you know. And talking with your supervisor, uh, there may be some some policies or practice or procedures uh, that you know will you know align with how to uh, approach this. Um, I've often heard that you know maybe it's not a good idea per se for you know, you know that the peer support specialist and, you know, the person they're working with to kind of be in, you know, in the same spaces outside of, of work. Um, so that's why I, I say both, you know, what Jan said and, you know, and then an administrative piece about the practices and policies and procedures. So it looks like you kind of moved around the grid and found a couple of different uh, responses that you would offer to, um, to Timothy. Uh, we had Denise with her hand raised. We also ran the gamut with um, responses from procedure and policy to um, encouraging the person to make a, uh, create some sort of warm handoff. So it's not just the peer. We also wanted to engage, you know, kind of gauge where the peer felt comfortable, how comfortable they felt um, in, in doing either a warm handoff or going to a service with this person. And um, the last thing we came upon was really um, beginning with the end in mind, knowing that um, one thing as a peer supporter is to have an idea of how to use community resources and bridging the gap and knowing that once you are introducing somebody to those community resources, that those communities, um, whether it be faith communities, 12 step communities become more important than the initial relationship between the uh, provider and the peer. Thank you so Thank much. You. And wow, we have Vera. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think we kind of touched on the plus. For me, the issue was in a peer run organization, the answer would probably be different than if you were working in the public mental health system. Um, and um, also the issue of um, why not uh, bring that person to church or invite them to church, it might not be a problem. I personally, as someone who is thinks of herself as spiritually connected, I would probably say, hey, what time do you want me to pick you up? But um, I don't think that's a very popular response. So it's, it's difficult. I do not think we are looking for popularity. That's why I, I tried to say at the beginning that um, it's different in rural areas, it's different in urban areas, it's different in peer runs, it's different in medical model. And even within those models, there might be differences from one facility to another. So <clears throat> I especially, I like Denise's warm handoff and I like your spiritual approach. All right, now I'm gonna botch a name, Cece? Yes, hi. I just want to um, 
like you said, you know, it's going to be different depending on what area you're in. But I think um, everything everybody said was pretty, pretty right on point. And I know some people have that, um, that ability within their, their jobs and um, the wanting to be able to like, create that easy bridge of being able to take that person to, you know, to the church. But I think also it's like, it's going back to that education of being able to like, help support your peer, like establish their own like boundaries and, you know, help kind of minimize the the effects of like burnout because you know we want our, our our peers to be able to have that that time and space to be able to attend to their own needs you know to whatever needs they may be you know in their in their daily lives you know so being able to kind of coach and mentor and provide that safe space to have that dialogue of like where are you where do you sit how do you feel with the situation you know is there other options that where um our client can get the resource, the spiritual resources that they need, or maybe there isn't, maybe it is a small town and this is the only resource that's available. So how do we empower our, our peer supporters to be able to set those boundaries and have those sometimes difficult, it can be difficult for some people conversations of like, hey, I understand that you're gonna be attending um, the same church that I do, but I just want you to know that when I'm at church, that is my time, that is where I fill my cup. You know, and, and I, I'm glad that you're coming, but I need you to know that in this in this area, I cannot um, interact with you unless you interact with me first because of you know whatever boundaries your work has in line for for you. You know, whether it's like a HIPAA violation or you know disclosing of their identity, and just to kind of like have the the client know like hey, this is why I'm not addressing you first. So they don't feel like you're avoiding them or ignoring them, you know? And this is how, this is where my boundary is for my woman. You know? I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> no, that That's makes- hard to articulate. Yeah. No, that makes complete sense. Um, when I was in direct practice as a peer specialist in a small town, um, we were told, do not acknowledge, if you see someone in Walmart, wait until, and then we would tell that to the participants. If you see me in Walmart, I'm not going to say hi to you because it would violate your confidentiality. So it is, it's a lot, it's a lot to think about. Although um, I can't remember if it was or I believe it was you, Cece, who talked about, we're, we're at two minutes of time, but I just have to say this. I think we can move into a bright new future when we can allow peer specialists to set some of their own boundaries yeah. exclusive of corporate policy. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think we're at time. Thank you so much, Kita and everyone. That was a really great wrap up. Um, oh God, we wish we had more time because we actually have fun doing this stuff. We do it for free. Um, we stay up all night and work weekends. <laughs> but we're not, we're not the hire though. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah. Well, we're not for hire under those same terms. <laughs> Hiring could be a volunteer too. So, <laughs> okay, so here's our contact information. Um, all five of us, you reach out to any one of us, you will get a pearl of wisdom. Probably because you'll be reflecting your own wisdom, but we can share that moment with you. So please reach out and please do the evaluation. We always learn from the feedback. And I just want to say a very special thank you to Cher and to Ruth and Libby and Dasha you know, for, for hosting, um, for all of our teammates who have been here and for all of you for coming to, to see what we're up, up to. Please spread the word and you'll be getting, um, I think, the PowerPoint and an opportunity to get the recording very shortly. So thank you all. Thank you, Rita. And Rita, thank you for being the win behind the sale. Yes. Uh, you've, you've really, uh, you know, wrangled this together. So thank you up to the very last minute. Great to have a colleague like you. Thank you. This is a great presentation. We appreciate everybody's um, attending. We're taking a short um, 15 minute break. Actually, um, we will be starting the next presentation at um, 2.45. Thank you again, Dasha. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Rita, I forgot to give a shout out to you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Did she step, step away?
I'll shout back. I'll shout back at you. <laughs> okay. All right. Take care, everyone. And I'm going to give a quick shout out again to Libby, who I see. And I see Jason. I haven't seen you all day. Good to see you. Great to see you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Great job. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here. Hi, Chris. Vera, thank you for your comments. Thank everyone for participating.